up, everyone? Hope you're doing well. Just wanted to give a small preface for this episode. So, in this episode of Follow the Data, I'm interviewing Ryan, and we're talking about acquisition of Amazon companies. And actually, I, I just I'm creating a special preface for this episode because I want to make sure you get the info here. Like, I really think that in 2021 and beyond, we will start to see the growth, accelerated growth of a lot of companies. And in that, I think that people might be at the point where they could sell their Amazon business and they aren't even quite aware of the fact that they could sell it for a decent amount of money. So as you're listening through this, I want you to know two things. Number one, I want you to actually really consider where you're going in your business. I want you to consider where you're at and I want you to potentially consider even the idea of selling what you're working with right now, taking that money and reinvesting into other platforms and also potentially in starting a new Amazon business. And if you're not quite at the point of selling yet, which you might not be, then I want you to potentially start considering that as an end goal. I think it's really easy to forget where, sometimes where we're going in some businesses, and I think uh, the idea of selling an Amazon brand is a pretty good goal to work towards in the end. So consider that as you're listening to this episode, and also consider Ryan as a good resource to go to, to talk to about selling your Amazon brand and your Amazon business. He's very knowledgeable in the space and he's very familiar with the the acquisition, with acquiring Amazon brands and businesses. So Ryan's a great resource. I'm putting his information in the show notes below. So if you're considering selling your brand or if you're not and you just want to learn more, hit Ryan up and we'll see. This is a great episode. I'm looking forward to it. Have a good time. I'll see you in there. What's up everyone? I got Ryan on the podcast. Ryan from Elevate Brands. And today we're talking about selling Amazon businesses and brands. In this conversation, I've touched on lightly in some of the past conversations that I've had on here. And I think we all know that as, as 2021 goes on and 2021 and beyond, this topic is gonna to get more and more hot. People are gonna be talking about this, I think, a lot more over the next year specifically. So before we get into the details though, Ryan, if you could just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your story and talk about Elevate Brands. Yeah, what's up, Cameron? Uh, great to be here and thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I started on Amazon in twenty at the end of 2016. Previously, I was in the commodities trading world, so nothing to do with Amazon at all. And uh, I moved to the US end of 2016 and I got really excited about, uh, about Amazon and sort of the e-commerce tidal wave that was very obvious at the time uh, and is even obviously more obvious now, but it was growing really quickly at that stage. At the time, I think e-commerce was like 11% of retail. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, at the beginning of last year, it was kind of 16% and now it's grown to 27% of retail. So it's just, it's, it's just an incredible uh, growth story. And, um, but when I started in those early days, I knew that the industry was something I wanted to be a part of, but it wasn't clear to me in what capacity I would be selling on Amazon. So I tested, right? I mean, that's what you do. So yep. we tested. Uh, so initially we tested with selling, you know, uh, um, retail arbitrage. We'd go into like Nike stores and, you know, buy Nike and a D-Buck and stuff from Marshalls, for example, and, and we'd put it up on Amazon and it would sell. And that was kind of my learning kind of process, training ground, just in terms of how it works. And then over time, we started developing wholesale and distributor relationships where we could sell bigger volumes and order bigger and sell a bigger sell bigger volumes of um, of that closeout sort of branded footwear and apparel. Uh, and then, you know, eventually we started testing private label. And uh, about a year ago now, so at the end of 2019 is when we really decided we're going to go ahead, uh, you know, full steam ahead with with the private label model and specifically the roll up approach. Um, and so we acquired our first Amazon private label brand in December of 2019. Nice. Uh, and then, of course, COVID happened, which which sort of made us take our foot off the accelerator for a short period of time. And then by June, we decided, OK, no, this this is this is a, this this is a sustainable business model and it makes sense. And so, you know, since June of last year, we've we've gone and bought a whole sort of bunch of brands. and We've got a pretty nice size portfolio now. And. Uh, and that's what we're doing. So we're buying, you know, we're buying Amazon businesses and, and we're growing them. And um, we've had amazing success, you know, uh, implementing kind of best practice in yeah. order to grow these brands, whether it's supply chain or branding and creative or logistics and, you know, all that good stuff. So, yeah. So so I, I'm, curious, I'm curious what, it, retail arbitrage, great way to start out. That's how I started out as well. It's a, it's yeah. a really, I think, very tangible way to get into e-commerce. It, it's like, 
it's the scalability of, of our retail arbitrage is a little more difficult, but it's a very, very good way to get your hands into the market and understand what it means to actually just get on the platform. So I, I love that you started yeah. in that way. And I think, you know, you know, a, a lot of life and, and, and business and selling on Amazon is just about like building your confidence and getting exactly. momentum. And so like, you know, I, I come across sellers sometimes that have been studying the Amazon marketplace for, you know, six months. They haven't done anything yet, but they've been studying it and learning it and taking courses. And all of that is good stuff. But what I always say to people is just start and start very small. Go buy a pair of shoes, put it up on Amazon, and then at least you'll learn how the process starts to work. And you start to get those little micro successes, and then you build on top of those. It feels pretty good to, I, I used to flip, I used to go to uh, thrift stores. That was my, because I, I didn't have a whole, I was in the middle of Amish country, in the middle of nowhere in Ohio, right? So I didn't have yeah. uh, very many accessible places to go. But the places that I did go to, I found out that VCRs and specifically like DVD VCR combo units sold for a pretty decent amount. And I found a spot that had a good amount. So that's how I got started. And when you make like 300 bucks off of selling one thing, just flipping one thing, you, it feels pretty good. And that, that small like step-by-step -step process to get you integrated is awesome. But I'm, I'm curious, so you jumped pretty quick from private, correct me, did you, did you start selling on private label or did you jump straight to we want to acquire. So, so I, I actually, I went, when I very, when I started the business in the very early days and I was testing out a few different models. So I was testing retail arbitrage and I was mm -hmm. testing wholesale. I also tested a couple of private label products, right? Yes. And they were, and they weren't, I mean, one of them was really successful, but eventually, but ultimately it didn't last because I took my attention off it. And then we got hijacked by some, um, you know, overseas hijackers and kind of killed the ratings on my, so I never pursued it. And I wish I had, because mm. it was actually a salt and pepper shaker. And when I look at some of the competitors oh, today, when I look at some of the competitors today that started around the same time as I did, they have mega businesses. So it's a pity that I didn't continue with that particular product, but, but I learned a lot from it. Right. And I learned about, I learned about, you know, the importance of supply chain and not running out of inventory and make, you know, and marketing it and, you know, being willing to take maybe a small loss at the beginning right. until you kind of ramp things up. And uh, so I learned a lot from it. And uh, and we kind of put it on ice because our reselling business had really taken off. Mm. Uh, and I was of the view that I should just focus on one, on something that's working right. and double down on that. And so, yeah, it took, a, you know, for about 18 months, that's what we did until we decided to come back. I mean, we still do the reselling business. We still have that. Right. Right, right. Uh, but now, but now we're now we're sort of you know primarily focused on the rollups and the private label. And, and specifically, so when you came back to private label, because I think this context is important for people who are listening. When you came back, then you decided to buy, start buying up private label brands. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And that and that for people who are listening, that is the context that we're speaking with today. That Ryan's speaking from the context of uh, this, this is truly a first. I think like so an individual on the podcast talking about buying up brands. Like this is, I think a precursor of, of a lot of what's to come. We'll talk more about that later. But I think that that context, pulling that out, honestly, the idea of selling a brand is, uh, let's talk about that. I think let's pull that out of it and focus on that conversation. Uh, or selling it for an Amazon seller, for an Amazon seller to sell, to build a brand with the goal of selling it. That honestly sounds like a big deal. And it is a mm -hmm. big deal to build a it brand. Is and to sell, to have someone acquire sure. it. But I think that that, it being a little bit of an unknown, makes it almost seem like an impossibility for an Amazon seller because it seems so far away. So to, I, I think it would actually be great to actually paint the picture of like, what does it actually look like for an Amazon seller to sell a brand and for you to acquire one. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're right, you know, three or four years ago, you know, not a lot of people were thinking about selling their Amazon business, right? And right. at the time, the multiples were very, very low. Uh, and there weren't many people buying them. And, you know, there was a lot of sort of risk in the platform itself and the longevity of these businesses. And so people, buyers never understood really how to think about them. Hmm. And now, uh, you know, the, the space is becoming a little more institutional. Yep. There's some there's some serious amount of capital that's come into the space, uh, and there's some more you know sophisticated you know buyers that have come into who who understand how to value these businesses, hmm. and who've been very successful in growing them. So, uh, 
So, you know, the process is, I mean, to kind of break down the process into how it works, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, I can break it down for your viewers into five, kind of five steps, nice, okay. right? Um, so the first step is um, if you have a business that you, that you want to sell, and we can talk about why people want to sell businesses, yep. but let's talk about the sort of the steps involved in selling yep. it. The first one you want to find, you want to find the buyer, right? And you can find the buyer a number of ways and you can do it as quickly or as slowly as you want, right? So um, if you want to take, let's say a little more time, you could go to a broker, right? And a mm -hmm. broker will then uh, put it on their website and kind of farm that, that offering out to, you know, hundreds or even thousands of people. And you'll get a number of people bidding on the business and, and not bidding on it yet, but looking into it and asking questions. And you'll set up a whole bunch of calls. You might have 10 or 20 calls with a whole bunch of prospective buyers um, and you'll take them through it and they'll, um, uh, and they'll ask you a bunch of questions and, uh, and, and you'll start to get a sense of who you want to work with. Um, and so uh, you can go with a broker and oftentimes you'll get a really good value. And if you have a broker who knows what they're doing, uh, it, can be, it can be a great approach right? Yep. Um, alternatively, you could go directly to a seller. I'm sorry, you could go directly to a buyer like, like, like us, for example, right? Um, and the benefit of doing that is you, know, you would save the 10% broker fee, mm. right? Um, and it also tends to be a much faster and more efficient process, right? Because right. You're, dealing with, you're dealing with one counterparty, or you could go directly to several buyers, Right. And whichever approach you, you, you take really depends on what you're optimizing for. Are you optimizing for price? Are you optimizing for efficiency? Are you optimizing for, uh, for how much time you have to spend in talking to different prospective buyers? Um, and it's a very personal thing that. Um, and, you know, whatever you decide, you want to go with someone who's experienced and knows what they're doing. Um, because, you know, the process of buying a business is. Um, is uh, I don't want to say complex, but I mean, there's nuances to it that are important to have some experience. Otherwise, the process can really drag on and you can get in all sorts of, uh, of, of trouble. So, so once you find the buyer that you're looking for, um, uh, you essentially, um, you, you, you know, you would sign an NDA, you have the buyer sign an NDA. And at that point, you provide, you know, a whole bunch of information to them uh, so that they can really start looking into the financials and uh, and understanding uh, your business, right? It's not a full deep dive due diligence. It's just kind of a, a basic outline of the details of your company. Yeah, and there right? hasn't been an agreement at this point, right? Like there hasn't There's been- There's no agreement. Sign. It's just right. a, it's a signed right. NDA, and then you just yep. give some information to the buyer to make to help them make an assessment. Because if they don't know yep. what your sales, they don't know what your EBITDA is, they don't know what your SKUs are at that point, they don't know what your business is. So, you know, you want to give them some information so that they can, you can see whether- they're serious and they can see whether they actually want to buy your business. Yep, that right? makes sense. And, and, you know, that, and so like everything I've just discussed to you could take, uh, could take, you know, months or it could take, you know, 12 hours. You know what I mean? You could come, you could call me tomorrow, for example, and say, Hey Ryan, I have this business. Here's the information. We sign an NDA. Uh, we look at the business and then we, we submit an LOI. We like, we make an offer and that can take 12 or 24 hours, or it could take six months. It depends yeah. on, who you're dealing with and who and and how you want to go about the process. Um, so once you've nego once you've once you once the buyer has submitted an offer, right, which outlines the kind of basic terms of the deal, at that point you would go into the kind of fourth step, which is the due diligence process, right? And the buyer is going to send you a you know a comprehensive list of things that they want. So they're going to ask you for your financials and they're going to ask you for any rental agreements and employee details and trademark and IP information and um, kind of anything and everything as it relates to the business. And, you know, the, the main purpose is there for the, for the buyer to just understand that uh, the information you say is true is actually true, right? I mean, the buyer is just going to double check that when you say your sales are this are, are, you know, $2 million a year and your EBITDA is, you know, $300,000 a year or whatever, the, the seller's just, the, the buyer is just going to go in and verify, pull the reports, check your invoices, make sure they stack up with your bank accounts uh, and just do that kind of due diligence. And, and that process, if you're dealing with, with someone experienced who knows what they're doing, uh, that process can take sort of two to three weeks, right? Uh, Some business, on top of can take, the additional time for the other steps, right? On top of the additional time. And the additional time, as I said, could be six months or 12 hours. Right. It depends on that. That part depends mostly on the seller, mm -hmm. right? But as it relates to due diligence, that part has to do with the buyer and, and also how responsive the seller is to providing the information. Right. 
right? So, I mean, if we ask for bank details and someone takes, you know, three months to send that, you know, it doesn't... <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't uh, take three months to send bank information, but uh, well, it you know. shouldn't, right? And and yeah. if you've and if you and if you've um, if you've got the right buyer who can kind of help you understand the process at the beginning, because you don't, you know, you can be guided through the process. I mean, we could we explain to sellers up front, this is what's involved. We send a list of information, and so everyone understands exactly what the timeline is, what happens when, how it happens, and we kind of walk everyone through that in a in a very simple and and easy to understand uh, way. So. So, um, so I mean, you know, provided that everything stacks up, uh, and it almost always does, uh, uh, you know, the final step is really then is, uh, is putting the agreements in place. Um, you get an asset purchase agreement, you put that in place. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, when, when both parties are ready, uh, you sign the agreement, uh, cash is transferred into escrow typically, and then uh, the assets and cash transfer to the to the the respective parties at the same time, uh, and you know, and then you go celebrate and pop some champagne. I mean, that's kind <laughs> there of the you go. Uh, See, okay, no, that, right? that process actually isn't. It is complex and it does take time, right? But I, I think yeah. that in sellers' minds, like that, a five-step process that you're working you're working with another party to make this happen. I would honestly equate it to for private label people who are listening. I would equate it to a couple levels above the first time you work with like a manufacturer to actually get your product in, there's a little bit of an unknown. There's another party that you're working with. Now, of course, it's more complex than working with the manufacturer to get your product produced. But there's that, the fact that I, I'm relating it to the seller journey of you have this unknown of what it even means to uh, get your product manufactured from someone in China, right? And then you do it. And then you go through the process, you look back at all the steps that you learned along the way and you realize, oh, okay, well actually, you know, it was complex. But I came out the other side knowing that it's possible and I can do it. I see a lot of yeah. similarities with this process that when you go through, because I, I actually have gone through the process of selling with a brokerage. And it's through that process, it wasn't as complex. It, there was I was stretched to do things that I hadn't done before because I had never, I'd never sold a, a brand before. But when, you, when yeah. I have to go through the process and the steps that were followed, you said, come out the other side feeling pretty good. How about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the nice thing about Amazon businesses is if you're going to sell a business, this is the this is the this is the best business in the world to kind of sell because, uh, and 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 it works both ways. It works for buying businesses too because the simplicity of buying and selling an Amazon business um, benefits so much from the sort of standardized format of the platform. But right? all, yes, all the yes. buyers looking at the information, all of the information is in the same seller central report. And we know exactly how to pull it and download it. And, and you know, we, we don't need sellers to come to us with a PL or a balance sheet. I mean, we, right. we just go into Seller Central, we pull all the information and we just rebuild it ourselves, right? And so we That's know perfect. exactly where the information is. And so these businesses are really simple to buy and really simple to sell. And that's part of the reason that uh, the space is becoming, you know, more attractive. So I'm curious, I want to I focus on the beginning or even before step one in that process that you walked through. I want to even jump back to the question of as a seller, like when, when do you think a seller should actually consider selling their business? Because from, from what I've seen, there is, there's this internal battle, uh, that, that goes on with Amazon sellers. That's like, well, I could sell my business right now, or I go through the process of selling, or I could focus on building even more mm -hmm. and scaling up. Like when, in your opinion, this is probably dependent on the person and where everyone's at, what they want. Yeah. When do you think when do you think sellers should start considering potentially selling their business? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a bunch of factors, and as you say, it's a personal decision, and it's gonna it's gonna come down to a number of factors, and and we, let's talk about some of those factors. So, sure. number one is oftentimes you'll find a seller who just feels burnt out, right? Like they're tired, they're burnt out, like they've had enough, they've built the business to a certain point, and they just kind of want to sell. Right. Yep. Other times it's not that other times. And what we're seeing a lot at the moment is sellers who've done a great job. They've built a nice business um, and they have sort of 98% of their wealth tied up into this business. Wow. Right. And so they want to, you know, and so they want to maybe take some chips off the table. So if you, cause I mean, let's just say you have a business that's doing, let's just call it, you know, half a million dollars of EBITDA, yep. right. Half a million dollars of profit, let's say. And you know, if, if that's the case, you're not taking half a million dollars, putting it in your pocket every year, because these are such cash intensive businesses. You have to constantly be reinvesting 
into inventory to grow the business. So if you're doing half a million dollars of EBITDA, maybe you're taking a hundred or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for yourself. Maybe, right? Maybe, right? And so, and so now you have an opportunity where a buyer comes to you and says, "You know what? I'll pay you, let's say, one and a half million dollars or something for your business." I mean, that's a that's a tremendous amount of money. And what we're seeing a lot of the time is a seller says, "Great, I'll take seventy percent of that money, put it in an investment property." or whatever I want to put it, or whatever I want to invest in. And then I'll take the other 30% and go start another Amazon business. Right. Right. Because you've got the skill, you've learned how to do it. The marketplace is continuing to grow. Uh, and so like we're seeing, a, we're seeing most of our sellers at the moment are, are, are selling to us and then going again and starting another business. So, so that could be another reason, you know, another reason you want to, you might want to sell is you say, well, you know what? Uh, I feel like I've grown this business as much as I can. So we sometimes have sellers coming to us saying, you know, we've sold, we, we've grown this as much as we can, but we have a team of three and, you know, I don't know, like I, I know how to get the business to where it is, but I don't know how to take it to the next level. And I think it has potential. And so like they can come to us and, you know, we have a team of over 40 people and we have experts in branding and creative, you know, world-class marketers, uh, SEO and PPC. We have, world-class supply chain people, world-class customer service people, et cetera. So we can take a business and really help it go to the next level. Uh, that includes financing too. I mean, sometimes you want to you want to grow the business, but you're limited with capital in order to grow the business. So um, that's another you know common reason that guys come to us and say, hey, like we think you guys could do a much better job. Um, and sometimes they say we'd like to stay involved in some capacity. And other times they say we're happy to sell at 100%. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, and those so, there's, are some so of the there's room, there's room in there to figure out there's room to come in as a seller and say, this is kind of what I want to keep with me. Or this is, this is what I want to do in the process of selling. And, and I'm sure that's negotiable, but at least, at least sellers have a little bit of an opportunity to come in and say like, this is kind of what I want to do. Uh, yeah. This business. Yeah. 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 Sure. And it depends, listen, it depends on the buyer. Some buyers say, I'm sure. going to, I only want to buy it outright. Some buyers say, I only want to partner with you. Totally depends on case by case basis. Yeah. So I'm curious what, from your perspective, like when you're dealing with brands and, and acquiring brands, what, what would you say is like potentially a really good minimum? Like sellers before even considering selling, like you should be kind of at yeah. this spot. Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on, uh, well, listen, that depends a lot on the buyers. I mean, mm -hmm. we look at businesses that are kind of doing anywhere north of about $150,000 of EBITDA. Okay. Right. Or, or, or in the Amazon world, we call it SDE, seller's discretionary earning. Um, uh, uh, so, I mean, for us, that's kind of the minimum level, but I mean, like, I'm sure there are buyers out there who, if you're doing 50,000 or $70,000 of, uh, of EBITDA, you know, you could still potentially sell to those guys. Yeah. And we will, we'll buy businesses anywhere, you know, I mean, as our company grows, we tend to buy bigger businesses. Yep. So, uh, you know, so when we, we can buy businesses that are five or even $10 million of, of EBITDA today. So, how, yeah, how there's long, a pretty big brand. How long do you think these brands need to be in action to consider selling? Yeah. Um, it, so, I mean, like typically we want to see sort of at least 18 months. Uh, but we've but we've also looked at businesses that are under a year old, you know, right. depending on the unique circumstances. So, you know, typically like, Typically, if you're 18 months or two years uh, and you feel like, you know, you're kind of around the $100,000 EBITDA level, uh, then, you know, at that point, you should, you could start to consider selling, right? right. If you wanted to. Could. Yeah. could is the key, right? Because you can always scale more. And as you scale the business, it'll be worth more as you go on up. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So, so of course you can always, you can always scale it more. Um, and there's, uh, there's always the risk that if you, it's always real. I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, oh, yeah. tomorrow you could have a barrage of, of sort of sellers from China or somewhere else that compete with your listing. Right. Uh, and, you know, and so like that's a problem. Or you could grow the business 3x. And, you know, I mean, like now, for example, a lot of sellers have benefited from COVID. You know, if you were selling, you know, something in the bread making business, for example, I mean, everyone was making bread oh, over gosh. COVID. So, I mean, if you did that, like your business just skyrocketed. And most people's businesses grew over COVID. So, um, sometimes you get lucky, other times you don't, and it's uh, it's you know that's 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 what the and that's, that's what, what it's like. as as a seller, if you haven't sold business and you go through the process of selling and you get some evaluations, it's going to be pretty hard to say no. To be honest, like when you when you see the chunk of money that you could get from selling, it's it's pretty appealing as a seller. Um, but yeah. but I, I'm curious. So you you've had your eye on on acquiring brands. So you you 
have a really good eye on what people, where people are at and, and I think what it takes, right? So what would you say, like, what are some of the key principles that some sellers should keep in mind to really help them stand out? Whether that's seeds that they can plant now or just things they can do with their brand now that will really help their evaluation moving forward. Yeah, yeah, no, good question. So, you know, sustainability of the business is really what is really what the buyer is looking for, right? Yeah. So the more sustainable the business and the more likelihood that the earnings will continue to be there, the more valuable that business is. So, you know, if your business has increased 10x over the last, you know, six months, because you're now selling, let's say, fidget spinners, as, as just an extreme example, sure. or you're selling something that is highly COVID dependent, if you're selling like, you know, face masks, right? Like, a buyer is going to look at that and say, like, how sustainable are those earnings? You had a huge COVID spike and like now the demand has fallen. So not so not super sustainable. So on the other hand, um, if you have a product that is defensible in the sense that let's say you have a moat. So let's say you have by far the most amount of reviews in your particular niche. Right. And you have 70 percent. Just as an example, you have 70 percent or a very high portion of sales in your category. Um, it's difficult for the number two guy to catch you. Because the firewheel is working for you, right? You're getting the organic sales because you're at the top of the page, um, and your and your advertising is cheaper than the guy who's coming from below, and so so you keep pulling away further and further. So it's difficult for a guy to catch you if you're sort of a very dominant player. Right. Um, another thing that's important that that can help you stand out is you know if your product, for example, is made in the U.S. Right? Mm. People like that. It's not so easy for competition because this is what the buyer is concerned about: is how likely is it that the competition is going to come in and sort of gazump my business that, that the company can come and undercut me on pricing or do a better job on branding and kind of blow us out the water. How likely is that to happen? Yeah. Um, and so like, if you have a product that is made in the U S or let's say the manufacturing process is more difficult or it's, uh, or, you know, it's uh, you have kind of patents or IP or something that makes your brand different and defensible. Those are the things that are going to be important to a buyer. I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious. What about um, so when when looking at a brand? I, I'm just. I'm going to put this question out there. I'm curious your response. A single single um, single product storefronts on Amazon, meaning sellers who um, go on Amazon and they pull a bunch of individual products that don't match a cohesive brand, but that actually are performing well, versus a cohesive brand that has similar type products, like for example, a, like let's just say a skincare brand, right? Whether they have a skincare yeah. supplement. Yeah. Versus yeah. like a, the garlic press, the fidget spinner, fidget spinner, the yeah. uh, like spatula. What is there a comparison between both of those? Is the single yes. tech product even viable? Is that even a viable option? Yeah. So, so first of all, it's a great question, um, and it comes up a bunch. So it it this also to some extent depends on your buyer, right? If you're if you're selling to a buyer, if let's just say you have, uh, let's just say. Hey, let's look at two businesses. They both do a million dollars in sales. Okay. One business is selling a single product. Okay. The other business is selling 25 separate products that are all in different categories, different niches, nothing to do with each other. Right. Now, some buyers will look at that business and say, I want, I want some buyers will say, I want the one that has more SKUs because it's more diversified and there's less risk that the one product is going to get, you know, killed tomorrow. Yep. Right. Some buyers will look at it that way. Um, we, on the other hand, look at it the other way because because we're building a portfolio of businesses, we prefer each of those businesses to be as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. So like we prefer the business that has a single SKU or two or three or four SKUs, right? Versus the one that has 25 different ones because we already have uh, diversification within the portfolio. So there's no need to have additional diversification through the business. And all that does is add additional complexity actually right. for us. Right. So, so, you know, when we look at businesses, how complex it is to manage that, you know, how complex is the manufacturing process? What's the lead time of production? How complicated is it to manage that? Um, and if I'm going to grow 25 SKUs, I've got to put branding and creative and SEO work and into 25 different, uh, into 25 different listings. So, so um, it's, it's a, you know, we, we've done it and we can do it for the, for the bigger, but we just prefer sort of businesses that are more simple. And I think that's, I think generally, just from a high level on Amazon, I think that's where a lot of a lot of Amazon third-party sellers need to go. That's what I've been telling people who listen. 
to head in the direction of, of cohesive brand building as opposed to the different products and always stipulating that both still work. That's the important thing to point out. Like you're, what you pointed out is that a lot of this is dependent on what you want as an individual, but also what the buyer wants as well. And to hear you say that there are buyers out there that will buy that see it potentially even as an advantage, right? To be multi-diversified in, in like the spatula, uh, the spatula fidget spinner, or whatever, of the multi-market. Like there are yeah. people who are willing to buy brands like that and totally. are willing to buy the cohesive yeah. brands. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's good. What what are, what do you see? Some of the biggest what are the biggest mistakes that you see when brands come in and they say, "Hey, we want to sell our brand." What are some of the mistakes that that you see brands make? Yeah, so um, one of the things that surprises us often is is the branding and creative work. Uh, you know, I mean, like oftentimes it's very weak, um, and you know that's something that. You know, Amazon is such a visual platform. You know, someone's looking at your product in a sea of other products that are very similar to it usually. So, you know, to the extent that you can get really amazing photos and video done and A plus content, you know, just to help your brand stand out, that's going to be a tremendous help, right? Um, you know, some of the other things we see is just like really poor accounting sometimes, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think that's, that's probably one of the most common, common things I've seen. Yeah, it's super common. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's super common. And, you know, the problem, the problem with weak accounting is that, uh, I mean, from our point of view, when we're buying a business, it doesn't matter so much because Great. we're going to pull the reports and recreate the accounts anyway. So it doesn't matter from our point of view as a buyer, but from a seller who's trying to run and manage their own business, um, it's a problem because, you know, you, you, if you don't have good ac accounting, it's just like giving you optics. Right. It gives you sort of insight into where your business is and what your margins are and, uh, and, and if you don't have those optics and insights, you kind of fly, it's like flying an airplane blind. It's like, you just have no idea where you're going. And so, you know, we always encourage people, um, to, to, you know, invest some time and effort into getting some accounts. And cause oftentimes you ask a seller, you know, we had a seller, um, some time ago who, you know, they thought that the, the earnings of their business was like a hundred thousand dollars. Right. And yeah. we did some work and we went back to them and said, actually guys, like your earnings aren't a hundred thousand, they're 400,000. <laughs> Uh -huh. oh, <laughs> it was a nice surprise to them uh and and ultimate and it was i mean that was a great surprise to them and of it's course. happened the other way as well it's happened of the course. other way of course. Their business. Yeah. no that, that, okay, this no. this to me just this to me shows that to me is a testament still of of the the insanity of the opportunity of the amazon business to me right like, to me i see and of course it goes the other way like you said where it's actually worse than you expect it to be but the the seeming seemingly like the success of an Amazon business pushing you forward so much potentially that you don't and there are other factors that go to it but you don't get accounting right away and you just you, you just see growth at the highest level that happens yeah. very quickly and you just roll with that that to me is so funny like I agree I agree yeah. and it's and, 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 and agree and it's somewhat it, it's it's true and because you're right the thing about Amazon is you can just your sales can explode. I mean, if you launch right. a product and it starts getting traction, you know, before you know it, all you can think about is making sure the trains run on time, ordering new inventory. You're not even thinking about accounting. Right. So you probably want to get, you probably want to start investing in that right from day one, like yep. get it right and assume that your business is going to take off, right? Because it's good practice. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it, it makes you really legitimize the business. Well, I, I think you've influenced me to bring on an accountant. So I'm probably going to put that down. I think, that's really, <laughs> I think it's really important. Um, so talking about, I, I want to talk about 2021 specifically and just yeah. your high level thoughts on the year ahead and potentially the years beyond where, where do you see acquisition going in 2021? Yeah. Well, so look, first of all, I would say that, you know, the, the, the ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, for, for Amazon, you know, the whole ecosystem is really exciting. Like the Amazon third party marketplace is just getting bigger and bigger, right? It was a monster before COVID, and now it's like you know, it's now it's Same. yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean the, the the earnings, the sorry, the the GMV or the revenue of Amazon's third party marketplace in 2019 was about 200 billion dollars, and then 2020 it grew to by almost 50 percent to 295 billion. Wow. And so and so and so I've seen some forecasts for you know 2021, somewhere around 350 billion. And then beyond that, 
it looks like Amazon third-party marketplace could become a half a trillion dollar marketplace wow. by 2025, right? Uh, and I've seen, I've seen some estimates that it's going to even exceed that. So, so the whole the whole space the whole pie is expanding for everyone, right? So it's right. a great time. It's a great time to be involved. Um, as it relates to acquisitions, uh, you know, more and more sellers are starting to see the opportunity to sell the business, um, and uh, because there's more buyers who are interested in it. So, you know, that's, so it's a great time. And, and, and some of the multiples have increased a little as well. So yeah. if you're a seller looking to sell, like it's a much better time to sell now than it was 12 months ago. Wow. Right. Not just have your, not just have your earnings increased, but, uh, but, but in fact, um, your earnings have increased and the multiple applied to those earnings have increased as well slightly. Right. So, so, um, uh, so that's exciting. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, in general, as it relates to the marketplace, you know, to me, one of the most under talked about things is is the number of new Chinese sellers actually that's coming into the marketplace. The, so, data, I mean, coming out, the, the data coming out about this is really interesting from China, yeah. people starting Amazon businesses. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, and in massive quantities. I mean, yeah. I saw a number um, that last year, um, approximately 50% of all new sellers were from China. I've even heard I've even heard a stat that seventy five percent of all new sellers were from China, and I I don't know which one is correct, but even if it's fifty, um, it's a big number, and and a lot of the time, um, and and the Chinese um, they tend to be I mean we I've done, in my previous life we did a lot of business selling in the commodities world selling to China, and they move with speed and aggression, oh, um, and of course that that is that is hard to hard to fathom, and you know you know e commerce in general is massive in China, much bigger than the US. I mean, 50% of all e-commerce sales worldwide are in China. Um, so, so the Chinese are, are coming in a big way. And, you know, it, oftentimes you see that their branding stuff isn't as, isn't yep. as strong. Um, but I think that's also going to start changing, right? They can use agencies and they get, they're figuring out ways to, 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 to make listings look really professional. And so I think that's going to be an interesting kind of challenge because they have price, many of them have price advantages. Right. I mean, oftentimes it's the factory directly that's selling on Amazon. So, you know, they have price advantages uh, over a guy who's buying through the factory. So I think that's an interesting kind of trend to watch. Right. Uh, and see how that evolves. Um, so there's a lot happening. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of growth. Yeah. Like, like you said, it's a good time to sell now. And I would imagine that there is a, I guess, uh, for my lack of knowledge of being in the acquisition space, uh, uh, an incubation period for brands to start in. So for example, like this statistic coming out about Chinese sellers starting Amazon businesses in the US. Yeah. I would imagine that we'll probably see the fruition of that if they sell, if, if Chinese sellers, like if these are manufacturers, but if there are other people in China like us who just come on and want to start an Amazon business, if potentially in a couple of years, we'll start to see a lot of Chinese sellers starting to sell their brands in the brand acquisition marketplace, right? It's just it's very interesting to see how this will come out. Yeah. I, I don't know if that, that clicks at all or if that's worth the consideration. No, no, I agree. And and the question is, will they be selling to sellers in the US or will they be selling to buy would they sorry, will they be selling to buyers in the US or selling to buyers in China? Right. And will the consult because there's gonna be because what's I mean, what's clearly happening on Amazon from companies like us is consolidation, right? Where we're consolidating smaller sellers and building it into a bigger company. Um, and I'm sure the Chinese are and will be doing something similar as well. Um, and so like, that's an interesting thing to watch because um, there's a lot of consolidation, but also there's a lot of new sellers constantly coming into the marketplace. Right. Um, so it's exciting from both sides. It really is. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, Ryan, I uh, want to lay on the plane a little bit. I, I want to open the door and ask for your last, your last words of advice for the people who are listening now. It could be having to do with uh, selling an Amazon business. It could be Amazon in general, the year ahead. What are your last words of advice for the people listening right now? Yeah, I would say, I would say you know, if you're in very early in the process, I would say two things. If you're very early in the process, get started. Just start, just test it, get going. You'll learn along the way. You may make mistakes along the way, but you know, keep trying, keep iterating, keep improving uh, all aspects of your business, and just keep looking for and just try and improve an inch every day. And the cumulative impact and effect over that over a long period of time uh, has been tremendous for us, and I'm sure it'll be you know fantastic for your for your viewers as well. That's great. It's fantastic. And that's good advice. And lastly, 
How can people connect with you and how can people connect with Elevate Brands? Yeah, perfect. So if someone's interested in selling their business or they're not ready to sell yet, but they're looking to maybe yep. think about how to gear up to sell and they want to just kind of have a general chat, we'd love to talk. Uh, we'd love to talk to sellers. You can contact me. Uh, email is easiest, ryan at elevatebrands.io. Uh, and and uh, we'd love to, I'll, I'll be very happy to, to talk to anyone. I'll put Ryan's info in the show notes below. So if you're even, like Ryan said, if you're even considering or if you're ready to consider, check him out, hit him up. Like Ryan said, now is the time. Like now, now really is a pretty good time to consider selling your Amazon business. Truly. Sure. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking time to be here. I look forward to our next conversation. Whenever that is, I look forward to having you back on the show and talking more because Amazon's hot right now and it will continue to get more hot. So Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Thanks. Appreciate it.